friends. Nice to see you uh, in a different format. I'm sure we must have met in many uh, conferences before, but uh, wonderful to uh, connect to you through this uh, virtual webinar of World Ophthalmology Congress. Uh, today I'm going to uh, discuss something very interesting, uh, uh, a multimodal uh, imaging device, uh, which can improve the uh, safe clinical workflow. Uh, the, the, the device I'm going to speak today is Anterion. I know financial interest. Uh, I've been a researcher working on different uh, Heidelberg platforms. It's important that uh, I use the word improve clinical workflow is because of the state of affairs we are in. So that's the whole crux uh, of the, uh, there's a whole uh, story behind this whole, uh, whole topic. So uh, these are my financial interests. Uh, as we look at the evolution over the years, uh, if we look at uh, different uh, topographers started with uh, Ridley's contact biometry, topographies, optical biometry, abrometries. These are all the evolution which we have uh, seen. But what is important here is now every single diagnostics makes person move from one machine to the other and uh, he keeps moving and it's a time factor and in today's uh, scenario we are in every time you move you're more in risk for the patient and also for the whole hospital and the technicians so this is what is the major fear today the COVID, the COVID-19 that's the reason we are trying to connect to this uh, last few months, we've been working on uh, some myths of uh, aerosols and droplets. Uh, we call the myths and signs of aerosols and droplets, which has got a small impact to the presentation today. So we call it as the uh, the uh, appear series, and this is this is what we are worried about: the contamination of uh, of drops, droplets, which which can have an impact especially when people move. So this was a study which we designed where we used uh, uh, lubricant drops uh, and then we did some non-contact tonometry and we found that every time the patient moved, there will be a lot of splash of these aerosols and drops. These were captured by very high speed imaging. So basically what we are trying to say, say is that every time you are making somebody move from one place to the other, you are impacting, you are creating a lot of unwanted droplets and aerosols, which we don't want at this point of time, because sterilizing, cleaning and all is going to be a major factor. So can we have all these modalities of what we use in our uh, anterior segment uh, outpatient build into uh, one? So anterior, the multimodal uh, device uh, is an all-in-one program. Now, how does it work? The principle is based on uh, SPEP source OCT. It has got a wavelength of 1,300 nanometers, digital, digital resolution of less than 10 microns. I mean, it's, it's the best in the league at this given point of time, and you can go at scan depth of 14 millimeters. What are the features it has? It's a four-in-one platform. You have an imaging app, app here. You have a metrics app. So you have a cataract app and a corneal app. So my whole presentation is trying to go into every single metrics of it. So if I go back to my, uh, the whole whole uh, imaging, the will starting with the metrics app. So you're looking at the, the whole anatomical structure from the epithelium, the stroma, the endothelium, you have a uh, trabecular meshwork, the sclera, the serial body, and uh, the beautiful lenses. And look at look at the beauty of this. This is what got very impressed to me. You know, the anterior lens capsule, the posterior lens capsule, the scleral spur, amazing clarity. And this is what really impresses somebody who wants to look at an anatomical structure. And uh, this is how the uh, the whole structure is. So looking at how we are going to use this, so we start with the uh, the cataract uh, planning here. 
And when we look at the cataract planning, uh, this OCT section visualizes the entire anterior chamber of uh, and representation of the retinal profile even through a dense cataract. This is very important because the first question people ask me is, can it pass through a dense cataract? Cataract as dense like this. And uh, we move to this is the, the spikes, which is necessary to know that you're getting through a good, uh, good uh, denser cataract. It gives you an automated axial length. You can see that lengths, uh, automated lengths are given here. You can see the images of uh, the eye and all the other parameters, which we'll discuss uh, shortly. And then if we are looking at, this is the same, the same axial length measurement which I showed in the previous uh, scans. And uh, you can change the eye status. For example, if you are uh, trying to look at a phakic eye, the phakic IOL, a phakic mode, pseudo phakic mode, piggyback IOL. So you can use different modalities. So you can choose the, uh, the eye status and it will help us in trying to uh, give a proper biometry based on the status of the eye, which is again a new features. And of course, a, a huge bunch of uh, IOLs from IOLs out there. Once you have a formula, which we'll discuss now, and you can just you know, log on to any of those formulas and you can choose the IOLs and you can even change your eye constant. And you know, these things are all quite common, like the enter target refraction and how it uh, gets your selected from your IOL database. So basically, it can penetrate to a dense cataract. You can choose the mode of uh, the, the state of eye. You can have a big IOL database from which you can get your IOL power, IOL formula, and basically it's all in one program built in out there. So which will help you to uh, get exactly what a cataract surgeon wants without trying to uh, take up too much of time. And uh, you can build your own uh, IOL uh, constants also. This is, this is the screen which comes in the machine where you can build your IOL constant. In fact, if you want it for a particular lenses. And uh, beauty is that it can pass through metro cataract, many places, you know, where we work in. And you can see the type of uh, the dense, uh, how there is a liquefaction here, how the dense here, the post capsule, beautiful representation of the lens, especially if you're trying, if you're trying to link it up with your, uh, the, uh, the femto-based femto, femto cataract procedures. And this, again, we have already mentioned, even as thick as dense as this, it can pass through. And that's what, People want can it pass through a denser cataract? That's why I'm repeating it two or three times to know that it does. And I've, we have some done some uh, uh, studies also on that. So there are times when you can enter manually also the axial length so that you don't, uh, in case you're not getting it, you can take it from any other immersion-based biometry and enter it. The posterior polar cataract again. This is where the challenge is, and sometimes it's very useful for a cataract surgeon to know is it truly a posterior polar, or it's just an uh, if there's a breach, or it's just an opacification. For example, in this case, you can see that that's an opacification, and uh, you don't see uh, the breach. So when you're planning for your cataract surgery, it really helps to know the status of your posterior capsule. And in this case, there is a pre-existing breach. And uh, you can see here, there's a breach out here. So you can, you can already know that this patient will have a problem or a complication during your surgery. So it's very important because if you're planning, for example, in this patient, you know, there is a giveaway of a posterior capsule. You can see there is uh, the breach and this extended. And this is the same patient which had, which clearly demonstrated that there is a breach in your posterior capsule. So it's very useful because at one shot, you know these, you, you know your formulas, you know your lenses, you know which, which I will choose, you know your uh, status of the lenses. Is it a uh, hypermature or is there a liquefaction clefts there? Or you can even know if there is a breach in your posterior capsule. So basically, it's just not giving you a formula or an axial length or it tells you much, much more than anybody else can do. Coming to the cornea application. See, I'm speaking from a cornea application from a purely 
a cataract uh, refract cat, uh, cataract uh, surgeon because many times cataract surgery you, you miss out the most important thing is you miss out the topographies and uh, but it can be used here the cornea apps can be used for a refractive surgeon also uh, because it has a single view it has like your pentagams it has your four view comparison maps follow-ups maps and also the multi-view uh, maps which tells you the change which tells you different uh, types of maps for example i'm looking at an axial tangential elevation maps exactly like how you have in your pentagram or cirrus the best fit sphere the best fit toric ellipsoids uh, the posterior surface of the cornea exactly the same thing which is there so it is a beautiful corneal tool uh, it uses uh, uh, a completely different technology unlike the shine plug or uh, the placido so it is very very repeatable in its uh, what is trying to give us for example if you're looking at this kind of a map you know this is a huge box out here anterior curvature posterior axial curvature the total corneal power the total bathymetry the pupil the angle kappa so all these things are all very important for a cataract surgeon for example sim case are very important because that's what we use posterior corneal astigmatism is important especially if we're looking at an irregular cornea total corneal power very useful for many formulas which we are trying to use and uh, especially if you're trying to look at uh, a toric planning and this helps to uh, each segment of your uh, total corneal power can be given so uh, these are uh, your the maps for the toric planning and uh, you know it tells you the lens and axis the orientation and it has its own toric planner uh, this total corneal power can also be added to your holiday formula which is uh, which is which helps to uh, to helps to uh, which helps to plan your uh, incision and when you plan your incision it tells you you have you know you if you put your uh, surgical induced astigmatism it tells you the IOL uh, location the sorry the incision planning for the reached residual astigmatism so basically it's like you get your topography get your get your biometry get your topography feed in your data put all the data you want and what you get is that it even tells you Okay, this is an axis based on your SIA. This is what your residual uh, SIA, residual uh, astigmatism is, and what axis you need to put. So basically, for a cataract surgeon, this is amazing because you get everything uh, at one go. And uh, for a premium surgery like a multifocal surgery, this is important. One is your pupil and the center X Y angle kappa, and we know that angle kappa more than 0.5 is something which is not uh, accepted uh this gives you at one go apart from all the other things which i mentioned and of course if you're looking at a post corneal astigmatism post refractive surgery eyes or you were looking at an eye oil power for uh, uh keratoconic eyes or suspect keratoconic eyes and post corneal astigmatism plays a very important role and that is something which is already here which is already given here which can be incorporated into any of your prof in your formula uh, this is something which uh, many other machines don't give you. Uh, uh, this is the aberrations many other topo biometers don't give you. Aberrations profile, like one look at the aberration of your cornea is very important because we are always interested in the lower order higher MS and uh, lower order aberration and higher order aberrations. If you have a higher order aberration which is higher, you know that you cannot use your multifocal lenses. So, uh, coming summary, summarize this part you have a biometry, topography, toric planning the fantastic corneal curvature mapping and then comes your beautiful uh, aberration profiles aberration profiles are very very important because it tells you is my patient going to be happy with your multifocals am i is my i'm doing am i doing good on the multifocal point of view even there are best biometers in the world but if you don't know this, your IOLs, perfect IOL formulas don't really help you. The perfect IOL surgeries don't help you. You have to understand the corneal aberration and that is what it gives you here. And uh, this is what I said, the lower order and higher order aberrations, which is very, very important in this case, it's a little on the higher side. Uh, Post-refractive surgery planning is very important because, you know, you have a flat cornea, there's a multiple other aspects to it. You know, your anterior and posterior curvature are uh, different. Here, what is interesting here is you have an uh, inbuilt uh, Barrett 
Haggis uh, formula is inbuilt there, and it's easy for you to, uh, to take the values from your uh, topographies and then value from your topographies and biometries and probably in incorporate here. So we don't need to go to the ASCRS uh, calculator, online calculator, because it's already inbuilt here. And you can choose your IL based on spherical aberrations. You can, because this is again, a lot of people use uh, extended depth of uh, lenses now, EDF lenses have come in. And most of the time when you have an extended depth of focus lenses, it's important to understand there is also a component of the corneal plane. So when you have a corneal plane, which has a different aberration, the depth of focus lenses would behave differently. So knowing the spherical aberration is very important also in planning your uh, multifocals and also planning your extended depth of focus. So it's just not your simple uh, uh, biometries or topographies. You can play around the optical tool. So basically it is more than it helps you to look at the uh, multiple dimension of what it multi multiple dimension and multimodal of what it does and try to build your a premium practice for example this is something simple about different types of ios which can be used for different types of uh, spherical aberration and this can be just got from one of the uh, screen buttons uh, when you when you're trying to look at the spherical aberration and uh, this is a screen which tells you different formulas different uh, holiday srkt and now we have barrett also formulas for IOL selection. So you have for the mono for the monovision or multifocals, and now this is the Barrett formula which has been incorporated uh, recently. So the question which comes always is uh, is when you when you have a new technology, the first question is how does it compare with the best? And the best two biometers we have today are the the Lensstar and the IOL Masters. So when you look at the, the curvature mapping, uh, the lens star, I will master, this is something, uh, this is the paper which is in the final review. Uh, and uh, we look at all of them and we found that they were very comparable in the, in the keratometry. And this is the most important thing. The two important thing in biometrics is keratometry and the axial length. And you can see that the lens star, I will master, and Tyrion were very, very close to each other. That means that if you are comparing with the best, it is equal and it does exactly the same thing. Probably what it scores over the rest is it gives you much, much more than what an IOL master or a lens star would do at this given point of time in, uh, in, in present circumstances. And the white to white, uh, again, it matches very close to the, uh, to the lens star. And uh, the lens thickness, absolutely all of them are bang on. So it means that virtually in all the parameters we studied, they're, they're very close and interclass uh, coefficient uh, correlation repeatability was very, very close to all of them. This is very important because we need to have a very good repeatability and that is what it gives you. So these, the, the Excel length, the keratometry, the repeatability, everything is perfectly similar to the best in the market today. So that is what this uh, paper just says. So uh, coming to the topography point of view, uh, this is always important because we need to know how good is the topography compared to uh, the other uh, tools which we have. Traditionally, what we do is, like I, saw, I said in the beginning, we have a biometry and after biometry, you take the patient to a pentacam or a cirrus, then to the something else. So here, everything gets all with one go and this is how the topography looks and uh, you also have the uh, the anterior segment uh, picture and uh, if you look at the single view of this this is a single view of topography on the eye and uh, this is the anterior uh, segment OCT picture and um, and these are the pachymetry map the total corneal it's something very similar to what we have in uh, most of the maps and this I've already shown you about the, the wavefront uh, apirometry maps and the utilization we all know and beautiful uh, keratoponus picture you can see and then aberration maps out here this is the wavefront aberrations in the keratoconic eyes and uh, these are the comparison maps if you're using it for keratoconus follow-ups or uh, post-refractive surgery follow-ups now the question comes i match the uh, the biometry with the best of biometers 
the second question is uh, always when a new new tool comes is okay now tell me how does this topography match with the best the pentacam and cirrus are the two top uh, topographers in the world today and uh, if you have a topographer people would always ask and i would always ask how can it match with the best and we did compare with the pentacam in many patients both the normal as well as uh, irregular corneas we are writing this as a manuscript and we should be ready shortly and you can see that absolutely the post elevation here you can see that elevation you can see the inferior uh, steepening which matches and the packy matches exactly the same so basically you are uh, and this is a normal corneas and this looks exactly the same both the anterior and the pentacam gives the, thing, the same picture so that means basically you're exactly matching to what we see on a pentacam so which means that your topographer is in sync with the best in the league so that is something which is very important and it gives us a lot of uh, uh, confidence to the doctor that well i'm not using something which i'm not sure about so what is our experience on this and you can see that the curvature map matches the pachymetry exactly pachymetry matches and curvature is just by around 0.25 that's okay that comes uh, that's that's considered okay and acd is more or less the same and uh, higher order aberration also closely matches even though they are two different technologies one uses shine plug one uses the spectral OCT, but still they match very very closely which is very good because it builds a tremendous amount of confidence what happens uh, how do we use it other than uh, the cataract and uh, the topography part we can use it in multiple areas uh, we can use it uh, in your icl planning amazing tool my colleague is going to speak about it you know sts the sulcus to sulcus white to white uh, angle to angle uh, measurement scleral sorry scleral to scleral per distance is what it gives and anterior chamber all these parameters it beautifully demonstrates very very useful for the the glaucoma surgeon in today's context again today's context is more about uh, trying to use it as minimal invasive as possible because of the scare we are in and the gonioscopy and uh, anything which induces tears has always a risk of uh, contamination uh, till we really know what is happening and at this point of time this anterior chamber angle uh, parameters are really helpful and scleral to scleral per distance also beautifully demonstration and angle to angle measurements all can be given and the lens thickness and the lens vault these are all very useful especially in your dealing with an angle uh, a closure glaucoma or a closed angle glaucoma and this are this is something which is very important and also for the glaucoma specialist the pachymetry comes directly over there and this is uh, very useful in in our practice uh, like i said in the beginning in today's context having all of them and lens vault is something very new it tells you the lens vault and uh, you know this is this is how you measure it from the angle to angle and then how far it's it's deviated from there is what gives you in the lens vault and it's given in this uh, measurement out here and uh, basically how we do is distance between anterior lens capsule this is your green use anterior lens capsule and lens drawn between the root of the iris and the lens drawn between the root of the iris and that distance here would be your the angle to the, the lens vault which is very useful uh, this is post icl the icl vaulting which we use which we have been using and uh, it's, it's just this case about the low lens uh, vault and how it has an impact on the on the lens can be determined and uh, you know whether you need to exchange the lens or you need to uh, uh, position is better is something which can be uh, disc which can be used uh, uh, which can be done based on these uh, scans these are high lens vault again you can see the change in the angle out here and you can see the amount of distance and uh, from the capsule and how the lens changes and beautifully demonstrated in uh, at one go so uh, not only for the cataract you know it has a huge 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 role and uh, in uh, phacic lens surgery in today's context phacic lenses are uh, are used very commonly you know on patients who are not suitable and many times it's the first line of uh, surgical procedures for a refractive surgeon again the comparison is a thief of joy but still 
we have to compare. Uh, I, we compared this with one of the best uh, modalities of anti-segment imaging from Cassia, and you can see that uh, when you're using uh, with this, the, the 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 vault is more or less the same between both uh, both the scans. And uh, the finally coming to the the role of uh, this as an anterior segment uh, tool, and you can see that the uh, DSEC uh, images. Uh, we can see that this can be used by the cornea surgeon also. And the cornea surgeon also can look at uh, multiple things, the host function, junction, the, the anterior chamber depth, the lens thickness for the intact surgeon, uh, you know, the role of how the intact is placed out here, and the depth of the intact can be looked at. And this is a lens glistening, eye will glistening in one of our cases, and you can see that how it looks at. What are, what are we looking at it in the future? It's a complete model, multimodal device. From looking at it, from looking into the future, what we request, what we are waiting for, is uh, probably helping in trying to understand the dysfunctional lens uh, grading. Uh, grading, you know, this can be done. I don't think it's too difficult, but it's something which can really help in understanding very early uh, cataract changes. Uh, desperately need an epithelial thickness. I'm sure. They're working on it as something which can probably come in the future. So from a, from a multimodal device for the patient care, I consider this as two and a half, three minutes of imaging where the patient comes, sits on the machine here, puts his chin rest. He gets this imaging done, the entire imaging done. If he's a cataract patient, he gets a complete cataract imaging done which includes biometry, the lens tail, the lens dimension of the lenses, the, the, uh, the lens thickness, the axial length, it is all that what the biometry would give. The complete biometry would be done. And after the complete biometry, you have a, a range of options for you, depending on what kind of eye you are looking at. And how do you look at what kind of eye if the patient is a keratoconic eyes? Out, out of, I would consider out of 500 patients we see, around six or seven of the patients have keratoconic on topography, which we have never seen. The patient has never seen, or we, so ophthalmologists have never picked up. So you can look at, oh, either it's a keratoconic eye, so I can help to look at, okay, I choose the kind of formula I want, or it could be a post-refractive one. So basically, and if it's a patient with a shallow angle or uh, very close angles, the type of cataract, the posterior polar cataracts, you name it, you have it. And what happens is it becomes so easy for a surgeon after the two and a half, three minutes of uh, test, you just sit and just sit with your screen and plan out what you want, pick up the type of lenses you want. If you want to adjust your uh, own uh, eye oil constant, you can do that. If you don't want to do it, you can use, you can have a array of lenses. Choose the type of, uh, you know, the type of technology you want. For example, if you have a posterior polar and you're, you know that there, has, there will be an issue, be careful, take extra consent. You are trying to be safe for the patient because if, it's a, if there is already a, a breach, and there, there is a chance that the lens can go, uh, can, lens can have a drop, nucleus drop into the posterior, posterior vitreous. So, and from a cornea point of view, it's just like your, uh, having a pentagon. So basically at this point of time, you have your best of topographers, best of biometries, best of imaging technologies, great tool and uh, software for a glaucoma specialist, which is from an imaging point of view, all loaded into one machine and patient has to just sit for two and a half, three minutes or even less than that depends on how well your patient is cooperating and you have everything ready for you and the patient just walks out of that place in this today's scenario with with major thrust of uh, of fear of aerosols and i did show that you know when especially you use multiple tools your eyes are watering and then you have a problem so major thrust is to see that if you move from one machine to the other with a watery eye then you are spreading the aerosols all over you have to have everything at one go and this is the go at this point of time and i feel in today's era this is what would be the best way to move forward and uh, thank the uh, the organizers of uh, woc and also uh, 
the team from Heidelberg, uh, Stephen and his uh, colleagues, for helping me to uh, present this and sharing this uh, with you. See you in uh, better times, and I'm sure everything will be all right. Just a matter of time. This too will shall pass. Thank you.